So I'm joined today by psychotherapist and author Donald Robertson, uh, most notably the author of How to Think Like a Roman Emperor. Donald, welcome to the Freedom Pack podcast. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Looking forward to our conversation. So as I just mentioned, your most notable book, How to Think Like a Roman Emperor. So I guess the place we should start is, why should we want to? What attracts people to Stoicism? It seems to be increasingly uh -huh. popular at the moment. Yeah. Everyone seems to, to be drawn to it. Why do you think that is? Well, there's a bunch of reasons. So actually, you know, I'm in a lucky position because I talk to so many people that are into Stoicism. I've been teaching and writing about it for like about 25 years now, right? So it's a long time. And I've spoken to a lot of people through the conferences that we run and courses that we run, thousands of people. So I feel all I have to do is just tell you what they've said to me. And so what people say to me is that they are attracted to Stoicism because they see it as kind of like a Western alternative to Buddhism or a Western yoga. Like, so it's more consistent with familiar cultural norms and values. And so that kind of appeals to them. Or they say it's like a secular version of Christianity. So although the ancient Stoics worshipped Zeus, they were religious and they had a theology, most modern Stoics are agnostic or atheists. So they see in Stoicism a kind of worldview and an ethic that gives them some of the things they want to get from Christianity, but it's not based on faith, revelation, or tradition. It's based on philosophical reasoning. Or they say it's like for academic philosophy, but it's more practical and down to earth, and they can actually apply it in their daily lives. So for people who kind of like, you know, uh, like I did a philosophy degree, you know, but I felt like it was missing something. I wanted to apply it to life, but, you know, I ended up studying things like Heidegger and Sartre and it was cool, but it was like, it's too complicated. Like, I, you know, it's hard for me to figure out how I can actually use this in daily life. Whereas Stoic philosophy is simple enough that people can actually live in accord with it like they would with yoga or Buddhism. And finally, the other thing is people will say it's like cognitive behavioral therapy or something like that except bigger in scope and deeper. So I'm a cognitive behavioral therapist. CBT is a bunch of techniques and strategies. It's not intended to give people a, a philosophy of life, but if you were to take the basic insights from CBT and build it into a philosophy of life, you'd end up probably with something that looks quite a lot like stoicism anyway. So people who like self-help and CBT, but want to identify with it at a deeper level and turn it into something more like a way of life find that in stoicism so those are those are just the things that they tell me yeah practicality is well, it's becoming a bit of a rare thing in personal development i think and a lot of people appreciate it and for you personally when were you were what originally drew you into stoicism and when did you start to realize this is quite practical well, it's a bit of a weird story, right? So like, it sounds odd the way I'm going to begin this story. So when, when I was a young guy growing up in Scotland, um, my father passed away, unfortunately, when I was about 14 years old. And he didn't leave many things behind. He left me a rack of his pipes that he smoked and his wallet and his books on Freemasonry because my father was a Freemason like most of my friends' fathers in the town that I grew up, right? It was kind of quite a big thing in that part of Scotland. And Freemasonry gave my father a philosophy of life. Like it gave him an ethic that he lived in accord with. And I, I looked at those books and I saw they were full of references to Hellenistic philosophy. So there's stuff about the Old Testament and King Solomon, but Freemasonry uh, incorporates a lot of uh, philosophical concepts. So it referred to the four cardinal virtues. It talks about Pythagoras and Plato and some of the symbolism that goes with those traditions. And so that got me at a fairly young age reading about religion and philosophy. I read all different world religions, you know, Buddhism and Taoism and everything. And I started to read books about kind of esoteric or Gnostic or apocryphal Christianity, in particular a thing called the Nash Hammadi Corpus. It's a bunch of Gnostic Christian books. So I was kind of reading about the spiritual mystical version of Christianity. It's a historical thing. And that type of Christianity was very influenced by Greek philosophy, Platonism. 
I'll tell you, here's a weird bit of trivia for you that I'll just throw in because I think it's so cool, right? In 1945, I think it was, they found under a boulder in Egypt, in this place called Nashkamadi, a bunch of books and scrolls that had been buried. It's an amazing archaeological discovery. And so they, they, these are early Christian Bibles that, that were destroyed and concealed, that the community was destroyed. And one of them contains all these obscure Christian texts. And in it also is an excerpt from Plato's Republic alongside the Christian Gospels. So in a parallel universe, my friends, there's a version of Christianity that evolved in which Socrates is in the Bible. How weird is that? Wow. Like literally, they have a Bible bible that's got socrates in it like but that community was uh, suppressed and uh, pagan philosophy was kind of um, oppressed by uh, the christian church at a certain point the philosophical schools were closed and so on and so that i read that stuff and it kind of sparked my imagination and i got really into philosophy then i went to aberdeen for four years and studied philosophy and i thought this is awesome but it's something's missing it's not it, 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 I, I would think back in my father's use of philosophy that was more practical and less theoretical, what Freemasonry gave him just a sense of direction in life and some values. And I wasn't getting that from Heidegger and Sartre and Wittgenstein and all those guys, you know, much as I loved philosophy, I thought it's not really giving me this kind of philosophy of life thing. And then after I graduated, because Stoicism is one of the few major schools of ancient philosophy that's not covered in most undergraduate uh, philosophy curricula. Um, so I, did, I discovered Stoicism pretty much as soon as I graduated and suddenly, boom, I thought, this is the thing that I'm looking for. And uh, that was like 25 years ago and I'm still into it. Uh, so I guess it, it kind of hit the spot, as it were, and it, it, it really was the, the thing that I'd been searching for all that time. Mm. I think with Stoicism, though, I keep seeing a lot of um, people online drawing parallels between um, stoic philosophy and our current situation um you know being in lockdown and some people might be listening to me now and thinking what can the stoics of over two thousand years ago teach me about how to handle this situation but I there know. was i think it was was it 165 ad um marcus Aurelius's empire was okay. faced with the is it the atonine plague the Antonine Plague, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and and Marcus didn't flee from Rome like a lot of rich people at the time. What can we learn from his response to that plague and apply it to our situation? I wrote an article about that for The Guardian a while back, actually, the newspaper, and it went kind of viral. It got, it got shared uh, 10,000 times on, on Facebook. So there's a lot of people have been asking about these parallels. Marcus Aurelius's book, The Meditations, in a way, in a sense... A bit of a stretch, but it could be seen as a kind of psychological coping manual for dealing with a pandemic, because he wrote it in the middle of a plague. It was smallpox, we think, probably, a type of smallpox. Um, a, a plague, a kind of pandemic that makes the current pandemic pale by comparison. Um, on many levels. For a start, has went on for about 15 years and killed approximately 5 million people just in the Roman Empire alone. Um, it devastated the society and it led to a huge invasion um, because the, the legions were devastated so that so-called barbarians along the northern frontier thought, this would be a perfect time to invade. Like, so it's kind of misery upon misery, really. Like uh, Cassius Dio, the historian, says that he thinks Marcus Aurelius was one of the best emperors, but one of the least fortunate emperors, because so many catastrophic things happened uh, during his reign, one thing after another. And so, as an aside, by the way, one of the other major plagues in history, like, uh, is the Athenian plague that happened uh, during the Peloponnesian War um, in the lifetime of Socrates. So Socrates is another important historical philosophical figure who there are stories about how he lived through a, a, another major plague, like a, kind of like our pandemic. So what Marcus tells us, um, first of all, that he, he thinks, he only mentions the plague once in the meditations. He only explicitly mentions it once. And he says, 
something quite paradoxical. He says, bad as this is, it pales in comparison to the psychological plague that's affecting men's characters. And geez, we can see like an example of that today with like, particularly in the US, which is actually what I thought you were gonna mention when you were talking about stoicism being very relevant and timely. You could say that awful as the pandemic is, there's a kind of sort of pandemic of um, corruption and aggression and prejudice and anger and that's affecting society. And so Marcus at the time was saying that we've got a bigger problem even than, than the Antonine Plague. Like, which is the, the this kind of corruption in, uh, in people's characters and disillusionment that's destroying the empire morally and psychologically. When you see the riots and stuff happening in America and the, prob the rising problem with domestic terrorism in America, um, at the moment, like you might say, well, maybe ultimately this might be a more serious issue even than the, the virus. Also, you could say that there's another sense in which there's a psychological problem that's more serious than the virus. And that relates to the pandemic itself. Because in a sense, pandemics are caused by people. The, uh, the, the virus itself um, only spreads because uh, people are in contact with one another, obviously. And you know the, the spread of it's exacerbated arguably um, by people ignoring public health precautions and by politicians confusing people about what the public health experts are saying. And, you know, so again, in a parallel universe, arguably this pandemic could have been contained and a lot of lives could have been saved if it wasn't for people handling it badly and giving out misinformation, bad advice, influenced by you know, sometimes political propaganda and, and so on. Um, and influencers on social media as well, also kind of giving people uh, bad advice and spreading conspiracy theories and stuff like that. So even in terms of the pandemic itself, the Stoics would say, you know, there's a problem that has to do with uh, vice um, and uh, corruption and sophistry, like that's making this even worse. The other thing that people say is how would the Stoics cope with the pandemic? And the, the, there's a, another paradox that I want to mention, which is in all honesty, the Stoics would say, the thing is we should already have prepared for it. So the Stoics prepare in advance for common adversities. Seneca, for example, says each day rehearse exile and poverty and death and disease. Um, and if you think of people like Bill Gates, who straight up told everybody there's a pandemic coming, I, and you know nobody really listened to it, we, we should have been prepared for the possibility that something like this would happen. So you might say, well, that's not much help, Donald. It's too late now. But actually it is relevant because the Stoics would say, well, in this pandemic, one of the things that we should be doing is preparing for other adversities that we're going to face in the future. Maybe even other pandemics um, some of us might experience in, in the space of our, our lifetime, for all we know, maybe even ones that are worse. This pandemic, awful as it is, the infection fatality rate is, is, is very low. Um, it's what is that, like half a percent roughly or something like that. Whereas the infection fatality rate of Ebola, I think, is about 50%. So we got off lightly in a way. You know, this could have been a much more fatal virus that, that spread all over the world. And, you know, so the positive aspect of that, I suppose, is that maybe we'll learn something from it and be more prepared for more lethal pandemics that might still be coming down the pipe in the future. So the Stoics would say it's an opportunity to prepare in advance for adversity. And, you know, also the, the fear of death and the confrontation with our own mortality. I wouldn't recommend this to everybody. As a therapist, people who suffer from clinical depression, for example, might not be well equipped, perhaps, to, to contemplate their own mortality. But for Stoics, this was a regular daily exercise. Seneca took it to extremes. Every night when he went to bed, literally, Seneca would say, maybe I won't wake up tomorrow morning. Like, as he wanted to encourage himself to really reappraise his priorities in life, like to think about this extreme, this kind of absolute of maybe this is it and how would I feel about it if it were. And I think the pandemic gives people that opportunity to think about their own mortality. And, I, you know, I'll, I'll cut to the chase and put this very bluntly. I think we live in a world, and we always have, even in ancient Greece and ancient Rome, 
where we're surrounded by smoke and mirrors. The Stoics have a word for it, they call it tufos, it means like smoke or mist. So we're sur surrounded by the prevailing values of a society, which are all about consumerism, celebrity culture, hedonism, narcissism, you know, all the isms. And, you know, shock horror, newsflash, it's all BS. Like, you know, we're surrounded by this because it seems to be what the media give us and uh, what other people are kind of buying into. But when we all reflect on it and the privacy of our own thoughts, I think most people come to the conclusion that it's all smoke and mirrors. And, you know, none of this stuff is really what life is about or makes you happy. And the Stoics just wanted to drum that home and say, look, you know, when you're confronted with your own mortality, you'll suddenly think, was it really worthwhile watching all those episodes of Friends or spending that much time on Twitter or whatever? Nobody has on their gravestone etched, I wish I'd spent more time on Twitter, like, you know, or, or stuff like that, right? We, we fill our time with stuff that's kind of trivial, but often we realize that when we're confronted with the, the threat of our own mortality. And the Stoics want us to really kind of think that through and reappraise our values and take the initiative to spend more time in our daily lives right now doing stuff that we ourselves actually find more fulfilling. Hmm. It's interesting you talk about death. We had um, Massimo Pigliucci on the <laughs> show last year, and uh -huh. he talked a lot about death and the stoic approach to death. And um, he said that there's no such thing as dying before your time, because when you die, you die. Is that something you agree with? Yeah, like I think so. I mean, I, I, geez, like I wrote an article about this recently where I really decided to go into it in a lot of detail because I, I've had, um, I don't know, maybe like four, four or five um, brushes with death in my life. And I have to say a lot of them were due to the fact that when I was a young guy, I was a bit of an idiot. So it's kind of my own fault, right? And some of it's kind of like, like health concerns and things, but some of it's just finding yourself in dangerous situations. I was giving a talk once to a bunch of people in a bookstore, and I just suddenly asked them, like, how many of you guys have had a brush with death? And I think it was about two-thirds of the audience put their hands up. So it's a relatively common thing. Now when I look back in my life, I'm a bit older, I can actually I have the luxury of being able to kind of review my life more. I look back on it and think, you know, those brushes with death were some of the most valuable experiences I had. They really shaped my character and they gave me, they, they freed me in a sense from the habits that I was in. They gave me an opportunity to, to really have more gratitude for the time that I had remaining. The Stoics sometimes push it even further. Marcus Aurelius at one point says, look, imagine you're already dead and you're kind of on extra time, you're, you're in penalty time or whatever. Like, you know, so you've been given a temporary repeat, reprieve, like you're on borrowed time, buddy. You know, what are you going to do with it? And it's an exercise not to make us feel morbid or whatever. The, the, the purpose of it is to try and make us experience gratitude for the time that we have and to snap out of the trance that we're in and really take more ownership, more responsibility for the opportunity that we're presented with. It's about, you know, confronting death in order to fully appreciate life. One of my favorite quotes from the Stoics is, is one that surprises people because it's a shocking one, I think. Um, Seneca said, uh, to learn how to die is to unlearn how to be a slave, which is a remarkable thing to say. And what he means is that coming to terms with your own mortality is potentially something that will liberate you from enslavement to the prevailing values of our society, enslavement to, to greed and uh, egotism and all this kind of stuff. It will snap you out of the trance and wake you up, potentially, right, if you take it in the right way. It's interesting. I, there's there's quite a big movement at the moment. Um, you know, I've interviewed one or two authors who specialize in the subject of longevity, and mm -hmm. everyone seems to be obsessed with extending life and uh -huh. not growing older. Um, you know, authors like David Sinclair, um, and 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 you know, quite it's quite a notable a movement. Everyone seems to be very interested in those episodes lately. Why do you think that people are so obsessed with this subject? And do you think that they should try to maybe live 
a deeper life rather than a longer yeah. one. <laughs> right. It's like, yeah, never mind the quality, feel the width kind of thing. Like it, it's it's about the quality, not the quantity of your life. And potentially, who knows? I mean, you could have both, but being too hung up on extending your life, I think potentially is one of the things that prevents you from being able to fully appreciate the present moment. I, I mean, I could see that you could maybe have both, but Epictetus says to his students at one point, you have to be careful in pursuing these external goals. He, said to, he says to his students, you can't mount two horses. It's like saying you can't serve God and mammon. If you get too preoccupied with extending your life, that's going to spoil your life. You know, you'll never actually have lived at all. The irony is, the Stoics would say that potentially becoming unafraid of death is one of the things that really liberates you to fully live, to, to, you know, to live more fully. Like, you know, you, you can only really, because then maybe you become, if you're unafraid of dying, you can do more courageous things in life, perhaps, you know, and you can stand up to, to dictators and tyrants more. You can take more risks and actually live more fully. People, the Stoics would say things like, would Socrates' life have been improved if, he, if he'd extended it for another few years? You know, not necessarily. You know, maybe it was his willingness to face death that really, you know, made him an exceptional. Certainly, that was what made him a martyr and allowed him to reshape the, the, the history of Western civilization. Um, would Alexander the Great's life have been improved? Like, if he hadn't uh, taken those risks um, and achieved remarkable things you know it's an interesting uh, question but i think potentially being too hung up on extending our life is a mug's game to be honest and it's super it's a sign of the the the, the decadence and superficiality of our morally bankrupt culture <laughs> <laughs> it um it isn't a easy thing to do like it's quite easy to say you know accept your accept your mortality come to terms with it it is quite a tough thing to do um when i first start when i first read um on the shortness of though? life by seneca i struggled with it uh -huh. i i remember i i i tried you know why that and I, no please tell me because you're a young guy right like i think that's part of it i've had this conversation okay. with people before it's always younger guys and gals who say but it's hard to wait once i hate to like spoiler alert buddy as you get older people die right yeah. around you and of course, you, you, you see more people die as you get older. Like mm. by the time you're 50 and 60, like a bunch of your friends will be dead and like mm. relatives are dead. And you'll maybe have had some health scares and stuff like that, you know? So not everybody grows wiser as they get older, but you have far more exposure to bereavement and your own mortality as you age, like okay. for sure. And so when I speak to young guys that like, you know, but it seems like kind of a shock to the system and all that, speak to people in a nursing home, like older people, like they've had plenty of time to come to terms with their own mortality. In a sense, most people have to have no choice but to come to terms with their own mortality as they reach 60, 70 years old. It, it becomes something that's, you know, uh, much more in, in your face, as it were, like it's part of daily life. Potentially. That's what happens when you get old, buddy. Like, <laughs> I like <laughs> but that. It's, I like it. it seems somber, but it's liberating. You know, yeah, there's, it sure. reminds me, when I was a young guy, when I was much younger than you, um, and I, I read Plato, I read Plato's Republic when I was like 16 or something. And there were bits of it that stuck in my mind for the rest of my life. And book one of Plato's Republic, which everyone should go and read, don't read the whole thing. Like, it's quite, it's really long, right? So it gets pretty dry after that. But book one was written probably at a different time. It's much more interesting. Just read book one. And book one, there's a guy called Cephalus, and he's an old dude. And Socrates says to him, could I ask you what it's like getting old? Because I think of it like this. He said, older people... It's like they're further ahead of us on a journey and they know what the territory's like that we're going to be encountering as we travel along the same path that they've already followed. Like, that's how he puts it. And I thought, that's really weird. It kind of stuck in my mind that he put it like that. And so he asks this guy what it's like getting older. And Kefala says, well, I hang about with a lot of other old guys because birds of a feather flock together. And so a lot of my friends are old dudes. And he goes, they all complain all the time. They're miserable. 
like they're, they're, they're always moaning about their bad backs and how they can't do stuff anymore that they used to. He said, but I'm different. He goes, ah, I'm actually much happier now I'm older. Like, I feel like, like I've been unchained from a madman, is what he says. Because I'm not running after, uh, running around after women anymore, is the way he puts it. You know, I'm not kind of things that I was preoccupied with as a young guy. I've kind of moved on from, you know, I'm not fixated on success anymore. You know, I'm not trying to prove myself and I can just kind of chill. So this guy says to Socrates, I'm actually quite enjoying my retirement. Like, I'm a lot more contented and happier now. Now, that in the Republic was meant to be an unusual paradoxical view, because like he said, most of the other old guys were just complaining all the time about how miserable old age was and how they all had bad backs and stuff like that. But his point is there's another way of taking it. It's like Epictetus says, everything has two handles, the good handle and the broken handle. Like, and philosophy is about finding the good handle and picking it up by that side like, so that you, you know, can actually turn it into, into something positive. And there is a way, I think, even of taking the adversity that comes to us all in old age and turning it into an opportunity. So this guy's a, a famous historical example of someone who thought, I'm actually happier than I was as a young guy. I find that I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm not quite an octogenarian yet, you know, like uh, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm approaching 50, but I'm happier now than I ever was in my youth. Like, you know, although I've got backache and a few grey hairs and stuff like that, you know, um, there are benefits to getting older as well. And I, like I said earlier, ironically, some of them come from brushes with uh, your own mortality. It's like, you know, the, the scary times in my life and the setbacks that I've encountered are all, along the way are, are, are some of the things that I'm grateful to for, for in a sense, having liberated me. Mm, wow. Now... I think a big thing that helped me on this topic um, when it comes to sort of meditating on your mortality. Um, now, I, I won't go as far as so one person I know has memento mori tattooed across his chest. He has a poster on the wall. It is his week in life in, his life in yeah. weeks and he ticks each one and, you know, obviously yeah. gets smaller and smaller. I don't think I could do that. But one thing I have done is I, uh, we had General Stanley McChrystal on this show before. Oh, used cool. To, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a general I spoke to response. him recently. Oh, wow. Amazing. Yeah. And what, one thing he told us that really helped me was he, he, the one piece of advice he gave was to write your own obituary because mm -hmm. you won't write down, you know, I want to make this much money. I want to have the most successful podcast in the world. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, he had the most. The things you end up writing are he was a kind person. You know, he was a thoughtful person. Yeah. And when you write that down and that, that, you know, that gives you much better insight on what, you know, you want from your life. And, you know, it reminds you there's a lot of time to achieve all that rather than, uh -huh. you know, the, the specific achievement. Do you think that's a good way of reflecting yeah. on mortality? Yeah, but I still think you should get the tattoo <laughs> as well. Like, I've had to be, like, it's dangerous territory talking about tattoos because people start sending me photos of them on Instagram and oh. things like that. Like, you know, like... The guys in pubs start rolling up their trouser leg and showing me their stoic tattoos. You'd be in Toronto, where I normally live. Like, everybody's covered in tattoos. Like, and there's a lot of people out there. But I think there's something interesting about that, because nobody gets a C I'm at the CBT. No one gets a, a CBT tattoo. I've not seen one yet. But mm. there are loads of people out there with stoic tattoos. So they identify with it like it's like Buddhism or something. Like it's like a religion yeah, to them. Yeah. You know, like you get it, they get it inked on them because they identify it as part of their personality, a lifelong thing, you know. And I think that's that's one of the unique things about Stoicism. It's not just a bunch of techniques, like it's a whole philosophy of life. And yeah, absolutely. There are many, it's not just the Stoics. Actually, Socrates was one of the earliest philosophers to do this thing that they call Melite Thanatu, which means... Um, rehearsing your own death or contemplating your own mortality. In the Fido, he, he says that um, ph philosoph all philosophy is a, a rehearsal for death. So this is the kind of famous iconic, for, everything goes back to, everything goes back to Socrates. So Socrates is like the godfather of Stoicism, but all philosophy and the whole Western philosophical tradition, although there were pre-Socratic philosophers, like he's really kind of the, the quintessential Athenian philosopher, and he's the one that we have to blame in a way for this contemplation of your own mortality business. Um, so it's very, it's a very pervasive. Like the Buddhists do stuff like that as well. But I think we can't really do it as easily in therapy. 
with clients is one of the things that exists more in philosophy and has therapeutic value, but it's not quite as common, quite as workable in a consulting room in a therapy context. So partly for that reason, it's, it's kind of, an, in a sense, an unusual or underutilized technique. But for me, it's a sort of an extreme, it's an absolute, you know, it's, it's one of the most fundamental um, stoic techniques. Um, and the Stoics would go even further. The Stoics always went further, right? They always wanted to push things to extremes. So you talk to the Stoics about contemplating death, they'd say, aye, but we go even further than that, buddy. We're caught, like, we'll contemplate the conflagration at the end of time of the entire universe. So they had this, <laughs> they go, I'm not just contemplating more mortality. Let's, oh, let's meditate on the annihilation of the entire universe. That was one of the things that they liked to, uh, they liked to think about. So it's, this, it's a very absolute thing, you know, what would happen if it all dis disappeared tomorrow? How would you feel? And so some people would say, well, I, you know, I'd, I'd feel depressed by that or disillusioned. But again, you know, that everything is two handles. Is there a way of accepting that and actually being liberated by it and turning it into a reason to actually focus more on fulfilling your potential in the time that you have remaining? That's really what the Stoics want us to, to turn it into. It's interesting you you keep drawing this parallel between stoicism and religion because quite often I, I'm I'm seeing more like iconography in stoicism. You see these guys that maybe have spent a bit too long on the daily stoic shop and they've got their Marcus Aurelius bust, they've got mm -hmm. their their daily stoic coins they carry around and they yeah. bring them out, you know. Yeah, a little stoic handbag, you know, <laughs> like a little <laughs> a little a wee, a wee stoic. Uh, uh, like uh, you know, beer glass or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't really. I don't think I've got any stoic consumer goods. Like, oh, but yeah. I don't have anything. To, you know, even in the ancient world, people had these things. We have what we believe in the British Museum um, to be a piece of jewellery that depicts uh, Zeno, the founder of Stoicism. So people would wear um, necklaces and rings and things that bore the image even of uh, Stoic philosophers and they, oh, they often had little statuettes of them. Mm. Um, you know, like even the Greeks and Romans liked their, liked their trinkets and they thought of them as just a, a tool for, you know, reminding them of their values. I don't really see anything particularly wrong with that. You know, there's a story though which you might know um, or if not you'll remember this, that Epictetus in his discourses talks about how his lamp was stolen. He had an iron lamp and someone nicked it, right? And so he's talking to his student, but somebody nicked my lamp. Like, and he says, well, do you know, it's my own fault in a way. This is how he turns it around. Because he goes, I had a nice lamp and I hung it outside and somebody thieved it. He goes, I should have put the cheap terracotta lamp outside instead. And nobody would have wanted to steal the case. So I kind of brought it on myself. In a way, he goes, now I have a cheap terracotta lamp outside and I, I don't worry about it. Like it's a kind of burden lifted from my mind because nobody would want to steal it. So I'm much more kind of relaxed about it. So that's his story, right? But there's a little epilogue to that story. That after Epictetus died, allegedly, we're told, some intellectual who was a kind of fan of Stoic writings bought that little terracotta lamp for thousands of uh, drachma at an auction like, so they kind of had a, had an au a kind of auction for celebrity memorabilia or whatever. And they're like, this is Epictetus's original terracotta lamp that he came up. <laughs> so I don't know if this is true or not, but obviously the irony of this story is that Epictetus is trying to make a point about not being attached to material goods and, and how it's worthless. And then some dude blew all his savings on buying it for his collection. Oh. Like kind of sort of completely missing the point of what the actual story do you know what I mean? Like the irony <laughs> of it. So I think that has to be made up, right? Surely someone didn't actually do that, but maybe maybe they did. But I don't, as long as you're not kind of, again, the, the Stoics would say, well, there's nothing wrong with having little reminders and things like that. But the thing is, if you get sort of overly attached to external things or place too much importance on them, then, you know, maybe you're, you're missing the point, potentially. Mm. Um, as long as you take these things lightly, Epictetus would say then, and you're not overly attached to them, then it's not a big deal and perhaps they could serve some purpose. So there's nothing wrong with me going out and buying a Ryan Holiday Ammo uh, Fatty medallion? I think so. They get the medallion and the, if you get the medallion and the tattoos, I think that's all right. 
Amazing. Like, definitely. Um, they would go well together. That, that, I said, do you not think that would look quite gangster? I think like, it would, yeah. The men, mental Mori medallion and tattoos, definitely. <laughs> I guess that's what happens when you combine someone like Ryan Holiday, who's, you know, he loves his stoicism, but he's also a, a marketing genius at the same time. Yeah, like, and he's he's brought stoicism to millions of people, Absolutely, literally. Yeah. Like, so I think that's a, a good thing. You can't draw a sharp line, you know, between, uh, I guess, teaching and marketing, because every ancient philosopher, well, not every, like most of them in some sense, or all of them in some sense, publicized their views. Anyone that teaches, you've got to be teaching to someone. You must have told people that you teach put a sign up or something. And a lot of them wrote books and published their books. Not all of them did. Um, but, you know, the, there's a sense in which they attracted students somehow or other. Like, so the Stoics weren't completely opposed to this idea. Um, some of the Stoics circulated their writings very wide. Seneca is an extreme. I mean, Seneca is not a role model in my view. He's a crazy a mixed bag morally. But geez, you know, Seneca was a professional propagandist. Like, and he, he primarily, I know some people might misunderstand what he actually was, but um, Seneca primarily was a professional writer. Um, that was certainly how he made his fame. And then he became an advisor to the, the Emperor Nero. So, um, you know, Seneca was, was all about circulate, circulating his writings and getting word out there and, and building a following and stuff like that. But again, the Stoics would say that there's nothing wrong with that as long as it doesn't become your priority. It doesn't, as long as it's not the be all and end all. As long as what you do is done in the service of wisdom and virtue, then that's fine. But if you, it would be like a miser. If someone earns money in order to put a roof over their children's head and food on the table, then that we consider that moral. But if someone starts to just collect, accumulate money for its own sake, like it ceases to be a means to an end and money becomes the end in itself, then they go, you know, from uh, being a, a pragmatist to being a miser, like uh, that's love of money. And so th this is true across the board in Stoicism, um, you know, gaining publicity for your writings, if that's a means to an end to discussing philosophy and sharing ideas and stuff, then that's virtuous. You know, but if you just are a big, if you're just a massive narcissist, like, and you just want to be famous for its own sake, then the Stoics would say, now you've kind of wandered off the path. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also it's hard to judge other people in that regard, right? So if you look at at somebody like Seneca, you might think, is he doing this because he's a massive narcissist, or does he just want to spread the word about philosophy? Like, it's difficult to judge from the outside. Right. But, you know, the, the Stoics, this is important to the, the Stoics. Um, external things and reputation and wealth and material goods are neither good nor bad in themselves. What matters is the use that you make of them. Mm. There's, we mentioned earlier, there's a, there's a lot of anger in the world right now on a political scale, um, mm -hmm. but also down to the individual, I think, with the, you know, the lockdown situations. I struggle with it. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I accept it, it has to happen, but I, I do struggle with it. And I, I find myself lately like snapping and getting angry at the most minuscule things. And Aye. I think, um, Marcus said that the, uh, consequences of anger are often worse than what provoked it. And, you know, yeah. uh, the Seneca who said you wouldn't return a kick to a mule. What uh -huh. is the stoic approach to anger and how can we better use it in situations that I find myself in at the moment? Well, they thought it was a big deal. Like they, Seneca wrote an entire book on stoic psychotherapy for anger, which survives today by some miracle called On Anger. And the meditations of Marcus Aurelius is to a large extent about anger. Um, it's, it's one of the main themes. So when people say what techniques would the stoics use, for instance, it, the first answer is they've got loads of techniques. Right, there's an entire book by Seneca. At one point in book 11, passage 18 of the meditations, Marcus Aurelius lists, he gives a kind of bullet point list of 10 cognitive strategies for coping with anger. Now, what I'd say about that is I used to teach psychotherapists, right? I ran a training school in, in the UK. And so for many years, I, I speak to rooms for life coaches and psychiatrists and psychologists and therapists. If I said to them, hey guys, off the top of your head, could you give me a list of 10 cognitive, give me a list of as many cognitive strategies as you can 
for coping with anger. I reckon they'd name three or four. Mm. Like, you know, maybe if they bashed their heads together, they'd come up with five or six. He lists 10. Like, so that amazes me. And not only does he list them once, he returns to them over and over again throughout the rest of the book. So he kind of knows them off by heart. Like, they're obviously, you know, very, very familiar to him. So some of them are things like, um, it, actually, one of the ones he doesn't mention. So he doesn't even mention, it's not even exhaustive. So there's another one that Epictetus mentions, which is what I would call a timeout strategy. So when you're getting really angry with something, um, the and a, a useful strategy is where possible to stop what you're doing and wait until you've calmed down and then think later when you've calmed down about what would be a better way of coping with it. And I, I'll explain that very briefly. For, incidentally, that technique goes all the way back to the Pythagoreans, to the pre-Socratic philosophers, to a common technique in the ancient world. Now, this is the way that I think people should think about it. Imagine that your brain goes in different states, right? When someone is angry or when they're depressed or anxious, you activate different cognitive schemas, right? So to use technical jargon. So your brain goes into a different state of functioning. Like it's wired differently when you're in that state. And do you know what your brain's really rubbish at when you're angry? Problem solving and decision making and creative thinking and stuff like that. So we know, clear as crystal, there's a whole battery of cognitive biases that come into play. So people who are angry typically underestimate risk, right? Uh, people who are angry tend to think in sweeping generalizations. They tend to jump prematurely to conclusions. They're poorer at empathizing with other people. So they're garbage at interpersonal problem solving in particular, right? So just knowing that alone, if you take a step back, you'd think maybe I should wait until I'm not in that brain state before I start trying to solve complex interpersonal problems. Like, because it would be like using the wrong tool for the job. Like, and so when you see it as simply as that, then the Stoics, of course, are right. Like, in the middle of a state of anger, unless you suddenly have to deal with the situation urgently, it makes sense to wait until you've calmed down and come back to it later when you're in a more suitable frame of mind to deal with it. And uh, then Marcus talks about a whole bunch of other techniques. Some of them are easier to explain than others. One is a very cliche, generic Stoic technique, the most famous Stoic technique, which I would call cognitive distancing, which is to say to yourself, it's not things that upset us, but rather our opinions about them. So it's not this guy that's making me angry. It's my value judgments that are making me angry. Would be another way of putting the same thing. And so Marcus calls us separating our thoughts from external events, separating in particular our value judgments from external events. And that's a subtle technique, but we know in modern psychotherapy, there's a lot of research on this. Like it's one of the most robust, one of the most uh, reliable techniques and it, it, it works across the range with a, a variety of different, it's one of the most versatile techniques. So this skill of cognitive distancing, really grasping the fact that it's not the other person that has upset you, it's that you're upsetting yourself because of your beliefs, value judgments and thinking. And just taking ownership for that alone will tend to dilute your emotional response or bring it down to a more moderate and manageable level. And the Stoics knew that. Do you know what's even weirder about the fact that they knew that 2,300 years ago? We only figured this out uh, 60 or 70 years ago. Like, because I don't know, you see, you know, again, maybe you're too young to remember this, right? But you, you, you've definitely heard of Sigmund Freud. Yeah. I remember when people actually believed the crazy BS that he wrote. Like, you read about it and think, that's weird. He said a lot of strange things. People believed it. Wow. Like, psychotherapists believed. For, there was a time when I, I remember, like, there were a lot of Freudian psychoanalysts around. Not really so many. Of them. It's, it's largely now viewed like alchemy or something. It's kind of extinct. Freud had no sweet idea that that's how anger and anxiety function cognitively. No clue, right? So it's even more shocking that the most famous psychotherapist of all time, um, certainly of the 20th century, um, thought, you're angry. What's probably causing that is repressed castration anxiety. Not maybe it's your underlying values 
like shaping you, you know, which we now know to be true. The Stoics knew that 2,300 years before Freud. They were a lot smarter than him. How do you think we got away from that and towards, uh, towards the Freud era? I don't know. What went wrong? It's a good way. You know, where did it all go wrong? Mm. Like, I don't know. I don't really know. I think Crazy. in part, like, I'll get into trouble for saying this. I don't mean, don't, please don't take this personally, like, no. sweet, sweet listeners. But um, I do think the cliched answer to this question is that to some extent it has to do with Christianity in the Dark Ages. Mm. Like, the, the closure of the pagan philosophical schools. Um, so people abandoned philosophy and kind of got more into Christianity. And at that point, they stopped really discussing psychology and psychotherapy in the same way. Um, and so it, it kind of got a bit suppressed or it got assimilated into Christian theology. And, and then it kind of starts to reappear again in the Renaissance. So that is the, the, a fairly common sort of traditional way of, of answering the question, where did it all go wrong? Sorry, Christians. But like that, that's one explanation. Um, but certainly philosophy died off. Like we were having a heyday. Every Marcus and we we're doing really well. We reached peak stoicism with Marcus Aurelius. Like it was trendy. Like, you know, we're told that. Like a lot of young guys started dressing up in robes and shaving their heads and stuff. And uh, they were all getting into stoicism. And then boom, suddenly, like a year or two later, nada, nothing like disappears from history. Like, after Commodus comes along, we could blame Commodus, actually. That's probably less controversial. If you've seen Glad you've seen the movie Gladiator? Yeah. Do you remember Commodus? Is uh, Joaquin Phoenix's character? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Right? This is Marcus Aurelius' his son. Um, he went a bit crazy and, and, and really became a bit of a mystic and wanted to identify himself with the god Hercules. And so you could say that you know, from Commodus onwards, people kind of become more mystical and superstitious and philosophy right. gradually starts to fall out of favour. So we'll, we could blame him as well. All right, um, we'll blame it all on him. I like it. Blame it on him. Yeah. And <laughs> Joaquin Phoenix. Yeah, that, that's it. Whacking Phoenix is to blame. I, I love it. Um, yeah. Now, one thing I wanted, one topic I quickly wanted to touch on before we start to wrap up. Um, people might curse me for bringing it up. They might think it's my age showing, 24 years old. You know, we're having a deep chat, philosophical chat. I want to talk about social media. Um, you know, I, I think it's something that's gone 10x at the moment, especially with uh -huh. people being locked up. I'm guilty of it. I've had to delete the apps off my phone because I found myself just mindlessly scrolling and being distracted. And I, want, I wanted to get your opinion on, like, how the Stoic approach to distraction and... Uh -huh. How do you think that they would have, uh, you know, handled social media? Would Marcus Aurelius be a Twitter troll? I think he would have used social media. Like, because like I said earlier, you know, it's not what you do, it's the way that you do it in Stoicism. Mm. So he would have said, it's part of my job as emperor. Let me explain. Marcus Aurelius spent decades of his life uh, studying Greek and Latin rhetoric under some of the leading teachers of his day. He didn't do that just for kicks. You know, he did that because a big part of his job was writing and delivering speeches and letters and uh, making public pronouncements. And uh, so he was trained for that. Like, you know, I guess you could say he kind of had PR, like media training and stuff in his days. He was a Roman emperor. It was a big deal back in the day. Like, so he trained for decades. And that's why his book is so good. Like, he... People massively underestimate how good a writer Marcus Aurelius actually is because it's just a bunch of aphorisms. And it's written in a very casual, informal way. But he's a very ta talented writer of aphorisms. And his speeches, which we don't have, like really, we don't have many examples of, were, were reputedly very well written as well. He'd be on Twitter. Like, um, you know, he'd be uh, giving speeches and things like that. Like, it's part of the communication that the job would have required. Um but he wouldn't have kind of got uh, too wrapped up in it or over attached to it. So, you know, one of the things that the Stoics say is that we have to learn to be impervious to, to criticism from other people. You have to learn from it, but not be upset by it. One of my favorite quotes is from Antisthenes, who's a friend of Socrates, kind of the precursor or the founder of the Cynic School. And Marcus Aurelius quotes him. Um, and he said, uh, is kingly 
to do good and yet be spoken of ill. And what that means is that true wisdom, true virtue, this inner kingliness, um, having the soul of a king, like consists in the ability to do the right thing even though everybody's opposing you, to do good and yet be spoken of ill, like carry on regardless, right? That's what true kingliness consists in. And that would be Marcus Aurelius on social media. He'd be like, you know, I have to use this for my job, but even if people are trolling me or abusing me or stuff like that, I have to learn to kind of take that in my stride. You know, like that's what stoic temperance is about in part, like dealing with other people and their crazy BS. Like, you know, Marcus says every morning when you wake up, tell yourself you're going to beat meddling, treacherous, um, devious, uh, deceitful people. And he prepares himself in, in advance to cope with that and deal with it rationally and wisely and virtuously, take it, learn to take it in the stride. Um, there's different at levels at which we can approach these things in terms of techniques, but, you know, the deepest level is just your fundamental attitude towards what you're facing. And so the Stoics would say, when you're dealing with all the garbage in the internet, you, you, you need to reframe the whole thing and view it as uh, like a training exercise. Um, view it as if the person that's trolling you is like a kind of sparring partner and they're there to teach you to develop patience, integrity, like strength of character, magnanimity, like, you know, and either, you know, if you take on somebody that's going to like just pummel you into the ground, maybe you're not going to learn from it. You have to learn to kind of pick your fights and stuff. Maybe there's some people you're better off ignoring and walking away from. But then there's other people you should view as an opportunity to develop, you know, your own strength of character. Marx really says the best revenge is to be unlike your adversary. Like, you know, so really it's an opportunity to be the opposite of them. When angry people, anger is contagious. Um, anger escalates, you know, angry, pe angry people breathe like rabbits. You know, one angry person makes up to other angry people, like, and then it just proliferates. So you have to be one of the one that kind of breaks the cycle. You know, like they, they win if they make you angry and you, you know, lose your temper with them and you get sucked into it. They're cloning themselves. They're turning you into, a, you know, like a, one of them if you just rise to it. Like the, you need to snap out of the trance and, and do the opposite. And that's hard. But like the Stoics think that's how we need to view the whole thing. Um, like it's a training opportunity. Or if they say it almost like another way of looking at it is like when somebody goes online and they tell you that, that you, they think you're an idiot or whatever, um, or they say something rude about your mum or whatever, like it's, the Stoics say, view it like a prescription, like it's medicine, like, and you have to learn how to take this bitter medicine in order to be strengthened by it, you know, like, and not kind of like, you know, spitting it out, succumbing to it. Like there's a way, everything is two handles. There's a way of taking the insult where you actually become stronger. Like if you kind of rise to the challenge rather than just allowing it to, to upset you, then you've lost like that's a sign of weakness, uh, Marcus says, getting anger is a, 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 a moral weakness in Stoicism. Mm. I have two final questions for you before we finish up. The first one is, um, we've mentioned your book, How to Think Like a Roman Emperor. Um, some of my, the reason I got into Stoicism was um, were books like The Obstacle is the Way, Ryan Holiday. I think for a lot of people my age, that was probably the book that drew everyone in and the Daily Stoic. And then I went on to um, Pigliucci's How to Be a Stoic. Then I started picking up, you know, meditations and on the shortness of life and so on. But what are some of your favorite books of all time? Well, I'm going to tell you, and I'm, I'll say something. I, I find it hard to recommend books hmm. with one exception, right? And so people recommend books to me. There's too many books in the world, you know. I think we should probably burn a lot of them. Like, you know, most of them are superfluous. Mm -hmm. Like, the libraries are full of them. Like, but there's a lot of repetition and stuff. So the, there's a lot of books out there. And, you know, but how many good ideas are, are there in them, really? So I don't like to recommend books to people. Like, everyone has their own preferences. But there is a book that I actually would go so far as to say radically that I believe everyone should read well, and it's a famous book and it's I would say that because I think it's a literary masterpiece 
and it's seminal and it's the most important philosophical text in the Western canon. And it's easy to read. You could read it in a couple of hours. Mm. And it's Plato's Apology. Okay. Like, I think everybody should read Plato's Apology because it's a masterpiece. And I read it when I was like 16 or something like that. And it kind of stayed with me for the rest of my life. Even if you read it and think, what is that all about? You, there'll be bits of it maybe you remember like 20, 30 years later. And, you know, worst case scenario, you've wasted like a couple of hours because it's not really that long. Like, but it's like Hamlet or something, you know, like except Hamlet's a lot longer. Like it's, uh, everyone should read it because it's, it's a masterpiece. And if you asked an ancient Stoic, by the way, what book should you read? I think they would probably have said Plato's Apology because even the Stoics and other philosophers in general went, this, this is the iconic seminal masterpiece of philosophical literature. Amazing. So that's one I'd recommend. I'm jumping on Amazon and buying it as soon as we hang up. I'll uh, I'll take your word and I'll I'll give it a go. Um, yeah. The last question I have for you, for Donald Robertson, what yeah. makes a life worth living? What makes a life worth living? The thing, um, I think there's a bunch of things that I could maybe say in response to that. I think. Uh, do you know, I'm just going to, I'll repeat what Socrates says in Plato's Apology. Socrates said the unexamined life is not worth living. So Socrates says very clearly that he thinks it's the quest for wisdom. So he thinks we'll never really attain wisdom. It's a, an impossible ideal. But, you know, the closest that we can get is the desire for wisdom. Like the love of wisdom, that's what the word philosophy, the clues in the name, like that's what philosophy means. It means love of wisdom, right? So it's seeking wisdom. It's pursuing it, like... You know, it's trying to get it. That's what life is all about. Otherwise, what are you doing with your time? You know, like our freedom consists in trying to figure things out. We've got a brain. We use language. We're self-aware. We have this gift of nature. And the Stoics thought it's like having a toolbox that you never use, right? Nature gave you these tools to be able to think and figure things out and do logic. Like, the, you know, nature's kind of hinting, prodding. You're supposed to figure out how to do this properly. You know, I'm giving you this toolbox for your Christmas so you can figure out how to make things with it, right? You got reason, you got self-awareness so that you can approach wisdom, like, so that you can think rationally about your life. So the Stoics would say the goal of life is to live rationally, to apply reason to your daily life. That's the big, even if you fail and you fall flat in your face time after time, you know, it's the fight, like, it's fighting the good fight of reason, like, uh, of philosophy. You know, that's what really matters. That's what makes life worth living. And therefore, the unexamined life is not worth living. But most people spend their life avoiding thinking by, you know, spending as much time as they possibly can, um, you know, watching reality TV, uh, trolling people on Twitter or you know, whatever it is, that, what do people spend their time doing? I don't know. Like, sit, you know, sitting, getting drunk or whatever. And then they, and then they, you know, they reach the end of their life. They're sitting in their deathbed and they think, geez, maybe, you know, maybe I could have done something else with my time. Like, so it's time now to think about that. You know, your obituary, you know, what you want your life to stand for. What sort of person do you actually want to be? You know, like, are you going to go out without a fight? Like, are you going to make an effort to actually transform yourself into the sort of person that you would admire? That's what the Stoics are challenging you to do. Yeah, I wonder one day if I'm sat on my deathbed and I think, was Game of Thrones really that good? Yeah, I think you'll be on your deathbed, buddy, to be honest. And you'll be thinking, I think the last thought is going to flash through your mind. You'll be like, I wish I'd got that Memento Mori tattoo now that Donald <laughs> Robinson was telling me that should have got. Wish I'd listened to Donald. <laughs> Who knows? There's still time. There's still time. Yeah. Um, look, where can the people listening or watching find uh, more from yourself, your book, your work online? Where can they find you? They can find uh, everything on my website, which is donaldrobertson.name. So it's N-A-M-E instead of dot com. And anywhere, like just Google, you'll find all stuff about stoicism, videos and like a bunch of books that I've written. I'm doing a graphic novel at the moment, so that mm. won't be out for a while, but they'll find like little pictures from that and stuff online. And uh, yeah, all our conferences and things that we're running. There's so much. Stoicism is like a whole community. So there's endless conferences and podcasts and events and stuff, virtual conferences at the moment, obviously, because mm. the pandemic. So there's a, if you want to learn about it, there's loads of free resources out there on the interweb. 
and just out of interest, what is the um, what is the idea of, of, of the graphic? Is there anything phys- philosophical, or is it just for fun? Yeah. This graphic novel. It's about uh, it's Marcus Aurelius, his oh, life wow. and philosophy. So it's um, it's quite action oriented. So people keep saying, "Oh, that's great! You're doing a comic. I'm going to get that from a wee girl because she likes the Dino and the Dandy and stuff." <laughs> and I'm like, "It's." It's, there's quite a lot of crucifixion and torture and plague and stuff at light. I mean, it's pretty hardcore. Like, I got in the middle of it, and we got our editor, Casey Pierce. I got a freelance comic book editor involved. We've got a whole team of people working on it because Casey specializes in horror. And I realized halfway through that, I'll, not the whole thing, but a lot of it was um, horror. Like, actually, more than I initially realized when I mapped it all out, I thought, Big chunks of Marcus Aurelius' life are like a horror story. Yeah. Turns out, like, but I think it's cool. You know, there's a lot of philosophy in it. So when it eventually gets finished, it takes a long time. It's a big book. It's 230 pages full color. So it's pretty full on yeah. thing. It's, it's going to take at, at least two years to mm-hmm. do the whole thing. We're kind of about two thirds of the way through. So wow. like when it's done, it'll be quite a, a, a spectacular thing, I think. And there's a lot of epic battles and crazy uh, stuff that you wouldn't believe um, that happens. And it's very, he had a very dramatic life. Oh, I'm super excited about that. That's quite like innovative. I really like that. It's quite accessible as well. That sounds really good. Yeah. So I'm really looking forward to that. Donald, thank you so much for, for coming on the show today. It's been a, a really enjoyable hour or so. Likewise, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.